As we continue on our series on a mystical Christmas this morning, I, I want you to consider this question. Our first week, um, we, we asked a, uh, uh, a question and then we, we applied this idea of the mystical to it. We did it again last week. We're going to continue this week asking this question, why a manger? Now, when I was in college, I had the opportunity to read a wide variety of literature. And I found that despite certain preferences, in truth, I, I liked a lot of it. I think the secret lies in telling a good story, a solid story, regardless of the genre. And there have been and continue to be certain storytellers whose, whose works inspire me. And I'm I'm willing to read their works on nothing more than just seeing their name on the front cover of the book. One of the many works or, or artists that I encountered in college was the Nobel Prize winning German author Hermann Hesse. Now, the story that introduced me to Hesse's writing was one that came along in the middle of his career a book called Siddhartha, a sweeping tale of a life where a man achieved what he searched for. The story of Siddhartha is one of a young man who from simple beginnings seeks to find enlightenment as one of the shramanas or a wandering beggar of the Buddhist faith. Siddhartha follows this path, eventually even meeting the Buddha himself. However, his searching begins to lead him away from the Shramanas, and ultimately he rejects the teachings of Buddha in favor of a more personal experience of meaning that cannot be found sitting under the influence of a teacher. Siddhartha eventually finds his way across a river where a ferryman tells him that since he cannot pay the toll, he will eventually return to the river and make compensation for the crossing. Beyond the river, Siddhartha meets Kamala, a courtesan, for whom he must become a wealthy man to win her affections. He learns business from a man named Kamaswami and eventually becomes wealthy enough to win Kamala, although the accumulation of wealth was never a goal for Siddhartha. In time, he tires of the excesses of wealth and returns to the river to contemplate a better existence. Here at the river, Siddhartha reunites with the ferryman, Vasuveda, and in time becomes the ferryman at Vasuveda's death. Siddhartha learns and embraces a life of humility and simplicity along the banks of the river, simply learning to listen to the waters. Though challenges arise, such as the return of Kamala traveling to seek out the Buddha and the arrival of their son that Siddhartha never knew, Siddhartha lives out his existence in humility and peace, offering the wisdom the river has taught him to anyone who's willing to listen. The story points to this idea of humility and sees it as the core of an enlightened state of being, stressing the importance of the concept humility in daily life. This humility came from a life devoted to seeking the divine, at least from the Buddhist perspective. The story of Siddhartha was written as a story about finding enlightenment by the sum total of life experience. It is the idea that to be enlightened, one must be completely, must completely experience all things, good and bad, toward a process of wholeness. Now, when we look at the Christmas story, one of the things that jumps out, I believe, is the idea of humility, a word that literally means ground, earth, soil. It's very similar to the word Adam in Hebrew, the word that was used 
to describe and name the first man. A word that means from the soil. There are several ideas, I think, that give meaning to the use of these words. And that's why I would like to explore this this morning as we continue our series with the question of why a manger. Now, I think an effective way to understand this is with a bit of parallel imagery. Imagine the first scene, if you will, having a couple show up at your house. Their transportation has failed them. They're stranded. The woman is pregnant and obviously about to go into labor. You live a considerable distance from town, say, somewhere between Four Corners and Sundance. The closest hospital is not to be found. Did I mention that their transportation is a horse that died on the trail? Did I mention that you're supposed to think of this as being the year 1894? Did I also mention that the man and the woman are obviously foreign? Certainly not from around here. There's no room for them in your simple one-room cabin, certainly not for a woman giving birth, so naturally you send them to the barn out back. You muck it out, of course, because we're not barbaric animals after all, but it's still a barn, and she's still about to give birth to a child. Does it sound far-fetched? The second scene is a familiar one, sanitized according to our pseudo-Victorian values, traditions, and sensibilities. Our version has been seen in plays and pageants from what seems like time immemorial. The children parade in wearing costumes of various characters and animals, saying all the crucial lines and allowing us to dote on their performance like good parents and grandparents. The scene seems so familiar that we will never question it. It simply is what it is. And nothing can or should change that. I hope, however, to offer a bit of illumination on the oft-told tale by defining a few things and asking a few questions. The truth is closer to the first scene than the second. To begin with, a few definitions and remarks about the translations of things. First, the inn is not an inn. We always think of it as kind of a pseudo-hotel. But as you heard in the translation we read this morning, the word guest room is probably the best way of describing it. It's a room that's normally set aside for family who are traveling or friends or visitors. Quite frankly, it's being contrasted with a place where the animals are kept. A manger, practically speaking, as I told our young friends a few minutes ago, is little more than a feeding trough. It's a place that you throw hay for cattle or sheep. The manger was kept in a stable, which may have been under the house, or it may have been a cave, something cut out of the rocks nearby. It would have been an out-of-the-way, private sort of place, but nonetheless far from a sterile environment. One commentator wrote, a feeding trough served as a crib. How simple and bare it all seems. So what we have here is far from the Ritz-Carlton or the Four Seasons. It is a simple dirt floor, an animal sanctuary, a haven for humble creatures that serve as a place for them to be fed, that in turn they might become food and clothing for us. Yet, this is where 
the story of redemption begins. This is where the first steps are taken toward a life and death that will change the course of human history. When we look at the manger, we're looking at the place where history stopped and started again, where time itself was recalibrated into the time before the manger and the time after. And it isn't just the fact that Jesus was born, but how he was born. Into what circumstances that birth would bring about for his childhood and adulthood before his ministry. Jesus comes into the world in humility. Jesus grows up a humble tecton. That's the Greek word for a carpenter, a woodsmith, a craftsman. Literally, a maker of stuff. And he lives in humility as he enters into his ministry as an itinerant preacher, a man of humility and poverty. One writer says that Luke has kept the story clean of any decoration that would remove it from the lowly, the poor, and the marginal of earth. In the history of the church, there have been many so poor and abandoned as to be able to identify with this scene. As I said, this attitude is a lifelong expression of the example that Jesus set in his life, ministry, death, and resurrection. It is reminiscent of the hymn that is included in Philippians chapter 2. That says, adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names so that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth and under the earth might bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. For many people, this is a text that points to the divinity of Jesus, that Jesus was God in the flesh. And you can read it that way if you choose. But I think there's a bigger point to be made here than that, especially with the regard for humility. The point being that Jesus took on the position of a slave, someone inconsequential and disposable by the world's criteria. In the role of slave, Jesus was obedient even to the point of death on a cross, the nadir of rejection, shame, and humiliation. This is hardly the behavior the Philippians recognized in other lords, such as Claudius or Nero, who used their status to grab for more. In contrast, Jesus emptied himself, not of his divine attributes, but of his status. He made himself of no reputation. In other words, Jesus' birth, like his life, was a symbolic expression of humility before God and man. It was an example, as Paul calls it, for how we can empty ourselves of actions that are produced by selfishness, by sexual immorality, by corruption, by doing whatever feels good, by idolatry, by drug use, by casting spells, by hate, by fighting, by obsession, by losing your temper, by competitive opposition, by conflict by rivalries, by jealousy, by drunkenness, by partying, all of these things that Paul mentions and writes about. And he mentions them in contrast to those things which we should take up. If we follow in the way of Jesus, what we embrace is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As we consider the manger, 
there are a few things I hope you remember. First, that throughout the course of his life, Jesus displayed a humility that we ourselves can live into by following in the way of Jesus. That throughout the course of his life, Jesus displayed a humility that is our example. That we ourselves can live into by following in the way of Jesus. Finally, I want you to think about it and realize that throughout the course of his life, Jesus displayed a humility that we ourselves can live into by following in the way... That sounds repetitive, doesn't it? Some of you are wondering if maybe that was me losing my place. It's not. If there's anything that I can drill home here, I want you to understand that throughout the course of his life, Jesus displayed a humility that we can live into by following the way of Jesus. I think the day and age we live in makes this idea of humility such a demanding thing to swallow. I think it's where we get this idea of having to swallow our pride. One theologian writes that the world in which we live is no more welcoming of this story, no more open to this mind than was Roman Philippi. We are inundated with narratives that promise life found in superior force in acquiring the best looks, the best bank accounts, the best weapons, the best stuff. We're told that life is secured by our winning socially, economically, politically, religiously, and everyone else is losing. There is little room for the claim that the obedient death and resurrection of Jesus is the story of God's ultimate loving victory, the defining reality for all the world. And yet I am encouraged, despite this sort of gloomy uh, perspective that's presented here, I am encouraged to see more people, especially younger people, trying to find meaning in the idea of kenosis, the idea of emptying oneself as Jesus did according to the Philippian hymn. It is my hope that we who follow Jesus will truly follow, truly walk after, truly take the steps that he took, that we will become manger babies who grow into tech toy, those who craft and shape and create the world around them, by living into being humble followers of the one who taught us how to humbly follow after God. This is where the mystical aspect of the manger comes into play, a place where we find union and communion with God in humility before God and neighbor. It is here where we are able to find communion with God and unity as followers in the way. It is here that in our emptiness, we can be filled and filled to overflowing as followers of Jesus. <laughs>